The Exorcist 3 brings back original writer William Peter Bly, and ignores anything that insane second movie did in an attempt to create a worthwhile sequel. And this one does have a cult following, so maybe, just maybe, he succeeded. Welcome everyone to Screams After Midnight, I am Peter and joining me as always is Tim. Hello. <laughs> this is a horror movie podcast, <laughs> as that creepy hello may indicate. <laughs> we have been working through the Exorcist movies, we've done the first movie, we've done the second movie, and here we are going to talk about the Exorcist 3, or technically it's usually referred to the full title as William Peter Blatty's The Exorcist 3. So... That's what we're going to talk about today. <laughs> yes, that's what, and this one's got a bit of a cult uh, following. There's like a, you know, a bit of a buzz. You know, there's, there's a, I think I've always heard for the past like twenty years or whatever that Exorcist Three has its, uh, its, its fans, people who think it's underrated, <laughs> that it's kind of an unsung gem, and the idea that it probably didn't do that well because people mm -hmm. saw Exorcist Two <laughs> and didn't want anything to do with the third one, which you can't really blame them for, as well documented in our last Exorcist review. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It's kind of funny because I don't know exactly when the like conversation about it kind of started. Like I was trying to think because um, I'm not sure when I first saw it, but I, I definitely don't remember it being like highly regarded in the '90s. And then, like, definitely in the 2000s, I think that's when people started to be like, oh, you know what is actually good? Like, you know, Exorcist 3. Uh, and I, I wonder if it was maybe around the time as, like, the, you know, prequels or whatever started coming out. Not the Star Wars prequels, but the Exorcist prequels or whatever. Uh, I don't know if it was around then or maybe more, like, mid-2000s or... I mean, I don't know if anyone would have mistakenly assumed you meant Star Wars prequels there, Tim. Uh, like, I mean, this saying, movie's not that good, but you know what it is. Uh, I mean, saying prequels does make it sound like the Star Wars prequels, but I think, mm. to be fair, they technically only released one prequel. It's just that there was a second... I mean, we'll get to this, obviously, next time we do The Exorcist, because mm -hmm. we're, we're going to be doing both the versions of the, the prequel, but they made mm -hmm. one decide that wasn't good enough, or the studio didn't want it, and then had a whole second movie made, and mm -hmm. that's the one they released. Obviously, the original version did eventually come out on home media, mm -hmm. but in terms of like you know theatrical release, it was only the uh, the the studio mandated second version that got released. Mm -hmm. So, and there's some studio interference with this one as well, which we'll uh, <laughs> talk about a little bit. In fact, that's why mm -hmm. that if you're going to watch it now. Uh, if you track down like the Scream Factory Blu-ray, you actually mm -hmm. can watch a, a director's cut which mm -hmm. tries to restore it to the original vision. Uh, with a lot of mm -hmm. asterisks though, um, for a start, a lot of the original footage that was redone for the theatrical version is kind of lost and the only mm -hmm. source for it was like a really bad VHS tape. So, <laughs> it, like if you, if you I, and I looked up some of the screenshots, it looks very, very jarring because I didn't watch that version. Neither did you. We we watched the, the the full theatrical cut for this because the director's cut. Well, it's a nice idea. Um, it reminds me a lot of the Superman Two Richard Donner cut, and it doesn't really work necessarily as a full movie. It's kind of like an interesting what if, and you can see kind of mm. how it goes together. But the, the 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 footage that's not like been preserved looks so bad, and then there's other bits that aren't missing that are just mm. are straight up missing that they have to use some of the theatrical cut that doesn't go along with the director's original vision. That honestly, it's an interesting thing that is great. You can see some version of it, but I would certainly not recommend watching that as your first viewing of The Exorcist 3, just just based on mm -hmm. uh, snippets that I've seen or stills that I've seen of it. It's also kind of a weird situation because, like, usually you, you would want to watch a director's cut because mm. the original version kind of sucks <laughs> you'd be like oh wait no the director's cut though actually is so much better but like you know uh this is like a, a situation though where a lot of people actually like the you know original version like i mean I, who knows maybe the director's cut you know could be a lot better and stuff but it's not like you know most people are angry with what they got like, like you said it has like a cult following and you know, a lot of fans and stuff so yeah, and <laughs> sure, if we lived in a world where all of that original footage was there and it was, like, properly finished as a director's cut, like, mm -hmm. yeah, sure, I'd watch that and see what the, the original intent was. But, mm -hmm. you know, as it is, I think you should watch the theatrical cut. And then if you really like the movie, then, you know, go go watch the, the, the sort of assembly cut, I'll call it, 
because I think that's a better description of what you actually get with it. Um, so, yeah, The Exorcist 3 came out in 1990. Oh, we're going to talk about it. We'll start spoiler-free as we always do. Um, although there may be some spoilers for the first Exorcist, just because it, the way it ties to that movie, it's kind of may, <laughs> maybe difficult to, to mention it. But mm-hmm. uh, we'll give you a warning before we go into spoilers for this movie, and uh, we'll, we'll get into it. The, the basic premise <laughs> of The Exorcist 3 is that... Um, there's a serial killer called the Gemini Killer who has returned mm. after a 15-year gap, and he's supposed to be dead. Uh, but there is seemingly some connections between new murders that are happening and the exorcism from the original film. And we follow uh, the detective from the original film, different actor, but uh, George C. Scott plays mm. him here. But Kinderman Horror royalty. Oh, because of the Changeling. Yes. <laughs> what one movie makes him royalty? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, I suppose that would be true for other movies. I just, I just don't know if the Changeling's <laughs> held in the same high regard as, say, I don't know, like Psycho or Halloween or something with that. Mm, like Child's Play. <laughs> I see why you brought Child's Play up. I, I can see <laughs> through your, uh, your charade there, uh, Mr. Tim. Yes, mm-hmm. uh, Brad Dourif is in the movie. Uh, also horror royalty. But I thought that's what you were getting at when you said Child's Play. Right, but not everyone at home understood that. I give our audience credit, Tim. I think they could follow what you were doing. Uh, I'm, uh, I think a lot of people understand that I'm playing a 4D chess here and not everyone can follow. <laughs> 1D chess, maybe. I don't, I don't know about 4D chess. Oh, dear. Is regular chess 2D chess or 3D chess? Because I would argue that because the board's two-dimensional, it's, still, it's just 2D chess. The fact mm-hmm. that the pieces are 3D are irrelevant. The actual game is played out in a two-dimensional plane. So, like, what is 3D? It's really 3D chess is played in, like, a cube grid. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a great question. And now I'm just imagining, uh, I don't know if you ever played Tetris 64, <laughs> but, uh, like, when that came out, it was like, it's like Tetris, but it's all, like, in a circle 3D kind of thing in the, shapes are flying at you in space and you can launch a <laughs> rocket to blow them up or something i don't remember it too well but sometimes so that, that pops into my mind <laughs> yeah sometimes the simplicity of the uh, original mm-hmm. ideas will made it work in the first place yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah yeah tetris is a great game exorcist is a great movie i don't know what, what else do you want <laughs> i don't think we'd be comparing the legacy of tetris to the exorcist uh on this review but here we are well, they're comparable had the dodgy sequel. <laughs> then it kind of came back strong with, uh, mm-hmm. you know, later versions. Yeah, okay, mm-hmm. sure. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so... Yeah, we I, have I, uh, the, the, long bo- the long piece with, like, the little... The, the, the piece at the, the nub at the end. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> are you trying to... I mean, are you trying to insinuate that the cross is one of the shapes in Tetris? <laughs> Because it really is uh, similar. It's similar. <laughs> it's not even remotely similar. <laughs> that would make Tetris really hard if there was a piece of that shape. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right. So anyway, uh, I, I had mm. seen Exorcist three once before, probably like ten to fifteen Shocker. years ago. Uh, but I'll be honest, I didn't really remember any of it. I remember George C. Oh. Scott being in it, but like. Or royalty. I, you don't have to say it every time he's there. <laughs> but I didn't really remember a whole lot about it, so I was actually quite mm-hmm. uh, interested in watching it again for the review because I like I don't know if I just didn't give it my full attention back when I saw it. I don't know if I went in with really low expectations because Exorcist Two was such shit. Because I probably I probably watched it right after I watched Exorcist Two. You know mm-hmm. when when I first saw it, I, I was probably watching the sequels for the first time uh, back to back. So yeah, and it was. It, it might have been... No, nah, no, nah, it was probably after the fourth one came out. Because the fourth one was like, mm-hmm. what, the mid-2000s? I think so. I want to yeah. say between 2004 and 2007. Yeah, something in that range. Yeah, I think yeah. it was after that. So why I never went to watch that, maybe just because I thought it looked bad or something, but mm-hmm. I never, I haven't, I haven't seen either version of the prequels, so that's that'll be a new oh, interesting. journey when we get to it. Wow, uh, okay. But uh, I assume you'd seen this before as well. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I, I think kind of similar to you, um, it, it's not one that really st- 
stuck out in my mind, even though like I remember liking it. Like, I mean, I, I must have seen it at least once or twice before. I, I can't really pinpoint when, though. Um, and there's, you know, there's definitely a, a couple of very memorable standout scenes that like what was lingering in my head. But I didn't really remember like the finer points of the actual story and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of, the, one of the things about doing this show is that there's some movies that maybe I don't give a proper chance to or I don't really pay mm-hmm. attention to as much because I just put them on in the background. And then this, obviously, because I'm reviewing it and we're going to talk about it, I, you know, I, I, I pay attention. I sit and I, I watch. Mm-hmm. And I watch, obviously, there's lots of movies I watch and pay attention to just because I want to. But mm-hmm. this show forces me to maybe, like, pay attention to some movies that I might have let my mind linger from otherwise. Mm-hmm. And uh this is maybe an example where i didn't really give it a full fair shake the first time i saw it so yeah yeah, i was curious i was there was a you know potential here to see kind of some of the magic that clearly the internet and like the Mm -hmm. fandom is it sees in this movie so um yeah so we'll we'll get into it obviously the story is kind of crazy as well uh (laughs) and that's something we said about exorcist 2 but there's kind of Mm -hmm. a wild story in this one as well probably not quite as wild as exorcist 2 and it's worth Mm -hmm. mentioning that this movie at no point it doesn't contradict the Exorcist 2, I don't think, but it never acknowledges anything yeah. that happened. In it. <laughs> <laughs> you can just believe that the whole Reagan's like a superhero to fight demons things happening somewhere <laughs> if you want to, but you don't, yeah. you know, and you absolutely don't have to have seen Exorcist 2 to watch this. You can go straight from that to this, because mm-hmm. uh, the book, this is based on Legion. Um, you know, it's not called Exorcist 3, the book. You know, it's, it's just a book mm-hmm. called Legion that's a sequel to The Exorcist. And it has a bit of an interesting backstory. I think I read that it was actually developed originally as a script for a movie that William Friedkin was going to come back and direct, but then he dropped out, so Blatty just turned it into a book, and then mm. then he ended up directing a movie adaptation of the book. <laughs> so <laughs> it's got a, kind of a wild ride to to get to its, its, its final form. And then very late on in the production, uh, the studio demanded a bunch of things and changed some things, including having an actual exorcism towards the end of the movie, which wasn't in the original cut. So. Hey, where's the exorcism? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's basically what they did. Uh, there's probably some other things as well, I imagine, but that, that was the, the, the mm-hmm. big main thing is the ending being very different. So, um, yeah. All right. Well, Tim, what do you think of Exorcist 3? Was that the end of the question? <laughs> yes, that was the end uh, of the question. What more did you think was coming after that? Um, baby. <laughs> Since when do I call you baby? <laughs> oh, maybe just offline. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I, I actually like this quite a bit. Um, I I think there's like a lot of really cool, neat ideas uh, in here. Uh, it's kind of funny, like you're saying that. Yeah, you know, it, it is also kind of. Yeah, you know, crazy like exorcist 2 is crazy but in very different ways like and this is it's definitely a much more manageable uh entertaining make sense <laughs> kind of way but uh, at the same time yeah it really isn't exactly what i would you know typically expect from you know an exorcist sequel which you know again like we said um you know it's not a movie that demanded or, or needed sequels at all um but what's kind of cool about this is like it doesn't really feel like uh super sequely you know it's like yeah you have like some returning characters and stuff but um yeah ju- i mean just the fact that you know it's, it's even kind of called like legion you know sometimes instead of like exorcist 3 like it does feel very much like its own thing but uh th- there's a lot of really cool ideas here i you know i like the idea of the gemini killer and once we kind of find out uh who he is i thought that was like a really uh neat idea and um yeah, I feel like this isn't always the case when you bring someone in to, you know, direct that. Uh, I'm assuming this is like his first uh, time <laughs> directing. I, I, I don't know I'm if gonna, he... I'll click on his name and find out for you. But uh, yeah. I've never heard of him directing anything else. So, yeah, it stands to reason um, that might be the only thing. So, I mean, it, that always feels like a gamble when you're bringing someone in uh, that, you know, <laughs> hasn't really done it before. And obviously, like, you know, these stories and these characters are you know probably very near and dear to you know william peter blatty's heart but oh so to answer um, that question he's only directed one other movie and it was a decade before okay (laughs) he directed a movie called the ninth configuration oh that sounds familiar have i seen that i may have it's a horror comedy Mm. starring stacy keach 
and it has mm. Jason Miller from The Exorcist in it. It has Scott Wilson in it, who was in this movie. Oh, it even has Ed Flanders in it. There are tons of people in this movie from this, oh, wow. this film. Interesting. Uh, it's kind of um, Yeah, uh, I'll have to go and take a look at that. I'm not sure if I've seen it or maybe I've just heard about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm actually pretty impressed with his uh, directing skills. I think he, you know, uh, has a lot of really cool, like, good-looking scenes here. Just, like, um, a lot that really plays with the atmosphere that I, I did think there's, you know, parts in this movie that are legitimately creepy. And, um, yeah, I was very surprised by a lot of the restraint that he shows, uh, you know, there's probably, you know, one very notable scene that I think a lot of people that watch this movie kind of take away from, uh, that we'll go, you know, into, um, detail about, but, um, and, and I'm sure you can probably, you know, guess what I'm uh, alluding to. It's like kind of like a, a static shot of like this long hallway. Um, mm -hmm. but the, the patience that, you know, it, it takes to do like a scene like that. Uh, I, you know, it's, it's really impressive. Uh, and then, you know, it, I think, it, you know, it's a very memorable scene that, I, that, you know, ends up really paying off. Um, so yeah, no, I, I think, uh, this definitely, you know, deserves to have kind of the little cult status, uh, that it does uh because yeah it, it's very <laughs> entertaining and uh yeah pretty cool i was it, again it's kind of strange that like it's not one that i feel like stays in my head a lot but it's like you know the few times that i have watched it i do feel like i am like pretty impressed by the end of it yeah i again went and kind of like vaguely remembering it but not really having much of a memory of it other than just the one corridor shot because that's something that i remember even before i saw it the first time i remember people saying oh it's got mm -hmm. this one of the best jump scares in movies is an exorcist 3 randomly <laughs> and i think it, yeah if, if you ever watch like any of those i feel like sometimes like around halloween or something they'll have like specials like you know 30 best scares in a horror movie or whatever that's like one they'll usually be brought up yeah um but not really, again, not really remembering much of what the plot is or, or, or much of where it goes. And uh, yeah, I have to say, I did enjoy it watching it and really paying attention to it this time. And um, like, I know I have some fans that even will stand up and say they like it better than the first movie. I, I don't know if I'm going to go that far, but it's definitely an intriguing premise mm -hmm. that it's the sort of thing where if, I think when we get to the, the spoilers and I describe what's going on in the movie, I think if you said some of that to me at face value i think oh that sounds a bit over the top and dumb but mm -hmm. there's kind of some key elements of it that make it feel quite appropriate i guess so there's, mm -hmm. there's there's a couple of key details that just make it go oh that's not as silly it's actually there's kind of a nice uh demented link <laughs> to the first movie with uh, yeah i don't know there's, there's some interesting ideas um mm -hmm. But no, the direction is pretty solid, and especially after the second movie, which felt like... And it's from a, a director who has made notable movies that people hold in high regard, but Exorcist 2 is like this weird... <laughs> like It's like the director was scratching his art house itch and just doing mm -hmm. lots of weird things for the sake of being weird. This movie, like you say, it shows great restraint. There's a lot of really just quiet scenes that sort of build up. Um, it's very much an investigation movie with the with the the main detective looking into these murders uh quite early on there's a couple of like bits of evidence that suggest a couple things and you sort of i think you get kind of the broad stroke of what's going on quite early but there's a lot of specifics mm -hmm. uh, and the stuff that really ties it into the first movie come later on so now the cast is pretty strong uh mm -hmm. i would say george c scott is a very commendable uh leading man um mm -hmm. a lot of the small roles are, are, are pretty well handled um, I do love a movie that's just like willing, willing to have like its main character just be like this old, out of shape guy. Like he's like breathing so heavily through the movie, but I love it. Like uh, it's a, it's a, yeah. I feel like not something that you see often. Uh, I think I think it has to be though if you want to say this is this character from the first movie and it's been true. Yeah, yeah. You know. <laughs> well, the movie says it's been fifteen years, so I I don't know if it's it's flubbing the original movie to say that took place in nineteen seventy five. Or if this is technically set in 1988. But either way, mm -hmm. one of them's slightly off from the year of release. Mm -hmm. so, that is important, but just, just a minor note. It's been 15 years instead of 17. Uh, obviously, the, the Gemini killer, there's even like 
it's it's not hard to see a comparison in what the inspiration for this is. Like the Zodiac Killer is clearly, <laughs> at least in part, an inspiration for it. Oh sure, right. Uh, but no, uh, it was no, it was good. It was good. I, I I had a good time. Um, and it's interesting reading the differences with the director's cut because like some of them, I'm mm-hmm. like, I, I could see why this feels like the bombastic thing the studio wanted and how it maybe mm-hmm. ruined some of the nuance of what was actually happening before. But at the same time, mm-hmm. I actually think some of the stuff that was added in works well enough in the movie that I'm not sure mm-hmm. I need it to be uh, fixed, per se. But I'm sure there's some purists out there who'll, uh, mm-hmm. who'll, who'll be sh- appalled at that statement. Yeah. It, it's so funny because, like, it doesn't really feel like a, like a sexy, bombastic, like you know uh mainstream blockbuster kind of movie so it's funny to think of like oh like yeah like you know studio interference stuff like you know the, like the, the only like big examples i can see like oh yeah it is annoying for them like being like no we need an exorcism and it's mm-hmm. not really like the point of this story uh i understand that but i mean yeah like other than that like you know it's not like the like Hey, you're throwing this topless woman like 30 minutes in or, or like, oh, <laughs> hey, like, let's get some more blood and gore and stuff. Like, yeah, it doesn't feel like the kind of typical studio notes or whatever you would think. I don't know what the studio was like. Hey, like, you got to throw in like this, <laughs> this weird little monologue with uh, why he hates a uh, catfish or whatever. And he has one <laughs> swimming in his tub. Like, it's only like weird little touches like that. <laughs> like, it wasn't a catfish, they, was it? It was a... Uh... I forget it's some type of fish, carp. Something. I think it was a carp. I it began with, uh, yeah, I think it was a carp. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is such a weird thing. <laughs> I don't think that was the like, added for the theatrical cut. This, I mean, I don't know. I'd have to check the other cut, but I, I don't think that was a studio mandate. There has to be a monologue about joking. a carp in his bathtub <laughs> and how he hates that his mother-in-law <laughs> buys carps alive and wants to cook them for dinner. That would be so funny though if like those were the notes the studio was getting. Yeah. Also, George C. Scott's a pretty, mm-hmm. like you say, older guy in this mm-hmm. movie. So the fact that his mother in law is still alive is a. That's <laughs> true. Yeah. It's quite a test of it. I'm like, geez, how old is she? <laughs> oh, man. Um. So, yeah, I, you know, I think uh, it uses a little bit of the tripler bells at the start, but not much. Mm-hmm. It's, it's kind of like, you know, get you in the middle a little bit for the Exorcist movie, but other than that, it's. It's mostly original score. It's not. It's not a super invasive score. I don't really remember much of it, to be honest. I think yeah. it's kind of mm-hmm. goes by on notice, but I certainly never had any problems with anything it was doing. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, there's that. Um, direction solid. Cast is good. Uh, story's interesting. A little crazy mm-hmm. in places, but in a, in a mostly entertaining and. Uh, it's definitely. It definitely. F- doesn't ruin the mystique of the exorcist the same way that the second movie kind of does because <laughs> yeah. uh, for, for a start like you know the, the word pazuzu is never mentioned in this <laughs> and I, I think yeah. uh, that's for the better as well so uh, I appreciate that it's I mean it's nice that like they're not trying to like explain things that like happened in, in the first one you know and where they're like not trying to you know because like the second one had so much stuff where yeah like they're talking about pazuzu or talking about like stuff that happened in you know like the the priest pass and like oh yeah like there was another exorcism with this uh you know kid earlier on blah blah, blah. like you know the uh this movie it doesn't it feels like it's you know moving forward as much as it is like you know it, it's not dwelling on all this stuff in the past that's not really that interesting yeah yeah uh so i guess the we'll go- hint oh. is uh <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> what they kind of end up going back to because you know the next two <laughs> ones are like prequels and yeah. <laughs> I never really thought about it, but is it meant to be like a young version of uh, Max von Sydow's character who's in the the, the prequel? Um, th- that's what I, from what I remember, I, I believe so. It is kind of like Father you know, Marin's the character. If I remember, right? yeah, yeah, like chronicling like his first run in with uh, the demon or. Joe's <sighs> <laughs> you know worse is that we have to watch two movies for that review, and I'm not happy about. It. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's gonna be a tough one. <laughs> we we debated on whether to split those into just two episodes and just do like you know Dominion and the beginning, whatever way round mm-hmm. that they are. Uh, I, I would have said do the theatrical one that got released first, and then do the one that got unreleased mm-hmm. or released as a special extra later. But 
Uh, I think we're just going to do it as one episode and just because there's going to be so much comparisons to make it. It'd make the the second yeah. one would feel weird. I feel like we're probably just comparing it to the first one most of the review, so it probably just mm. makes sense to put them together. Yeah. So. <sighs> yeah, we'll give a spoiler warning for Exorcist Three. You have been warned. We're mm-hmm. going to get into it um, and talk about uh, the, the the crazy plot. Um. So a little bit more on the murders. Uh, you know, early on there was a murder discovered of a young. A young boy, a young uh, black kid who's about 12 years old, mm-hmm. um, who is seen in like sort of a dream sequence at the start of the movie. Um, mm-hmm. But it is almost like someone is leaving somewhere and going to where the kid is. You know, it's almost like someone's traveling, you know, spiritually towards him. Uh, mm-hmm. But he's killed and it's a super, you know, brutal. He's, you know, he's crucified using the oars from mm-hmm. like the, the local college, like, rowing team. <laughs> right <laughs> their oars are used to crucify him his head's been cut off he's been stabbed in the eyes uh mm-hmm. if, if I, they've also replaced his head with a statue of jesus which has had blackface put on it so it's like super controversial super <laughs> like you know as, as grotesque as you could probably make it and mm-hmm. then there's a second murder which this time is a priest and a confessional booth and mm-hmm. There's like a, a woman talking to him and she's basically confessing to murders. And then, and, you know, either really, it's, this is not like a gory movie by, but you know, for the most part. It's yeah. mostly setting up a bit of tension and it's sort of like the, the cut to the aftermath where the, the mm-hmm. detective and the, 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 the crime scene squad are looking at the case and whatnot. But the big surprise early on is that there's fingerprints found in both crimes. And the detective's like, okay, so we've got matching fingerprints then. And then the fingerprint guy's like, uh... Uh, hold that thought. Yeah, not really. And immediately, like, my, my thought at that point was, okay, so, like, different bodies are being used to commit these crimes. I, You know, I'm presuming that whoever the killer really is, you know, maybe a demon, is going mm-hmm. into different bodies to commit the crimes, and that's what's going on. Obviously, it becomes a bit more complicated than that, but that, that was my, my, my immediate thought. Um... And then the sort of the big one for the, for the main character for for Kinderman the detective is that his friend from the first movie, uh, the other priest. Which interestingly, the director's cut of the original movie, which I watched and you didn't, sort of ends in a way that sort of sets up this friendship because it's the mm-hmm. priest and the detective going off to watch a movie together, which is brought. Oh, up in the this... director's cut of the first first movie. Oh, the first movie, yeah. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so that actually sets up this relationship where they're mm-hmm. going to go watch movies together. Because uh, that's what he did with Father Karras, who, of course, was the main priest in the first movie. So, um, but he dies in the hospital, right? And he's all got his head cut off. Uh, it's a Wonderful Life's written in his blood in the wall. All of his blood's <laughs> been removed and put in cups, but miraculously, there's no spillage anywhere. There's not even, like, a bit of drip coming from the cups. It's, like, perfect. Like, so, this is immaculate. Um, Respect. <laughs> so, all, all this is, like, okay, okay, we've got all these murders. He's investigating stuff. Uh, but the real meat of it is when we're introduced to, you know, when they're, they're looking around the hospital, the, the, this this priest was killed in the hospital where he was in the hospital bed. Mm-hmm. Surely someone saw something. There's staff, you know, around. There's other patients. Mm-hmm. This is, like, weird. Like, how can no one see anything? And the only person that seems to have been anywhere near that hospital room is an old woman who is, you know, I don't even know specifically what she's got. I don't know if it's dementia, Alzheimer's, whatever. But she's this frail old woman in her 80s who can barely mm-hmm. walk, needs help to eat and do anything else. And she's in like, the, the ward with patients like that. Um, and it's like, this doesn't make sense. But her fingerprints are in the goddamn crime scene. But she couldn't have done it because she physically can't do this. Like, Because um, like, the main murder weapon, we find out, is this ridiculous big like surgical <laughs> like shear that's used for decapitations. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, and well, I don't know if that's what it's used for medically, but that's that's what the killer is using it for. Yeah, <laughs> um, and it's like this takes like strength to even open it. Never mind, you know, actually snap someone's head with it. So <laughs> it's like, how, how, what's going on here? Could, and obviously, I'm still thinking, oh, it's still you know they're being possessed. Like this old woman was possessed mm-hmm. and killed them, but it was another old person because we see like another old woman, like at the church, and I was like, okay, so she's the one that got possessed before, and that's who killed the priest in the church. Um, you know, so it's like, okay, okay, this is all coming together. But then the doctor, played by Scott Wilson, uh, who's chain smoking constantly throughout the whole movie, like he's like really <laughs> nervous about something. He like takes him to the 
the, the, you know, the security ward, the one that has the dangerous patients. And there's like this patient that's teased, uh, who's unknown, who was picked up 15 years ago, who was comatose until he sort of woke up and became violent many years later. And soon after that, the doctor says to the Detective Kinderman that this patient <coughs> claims to be the Gemini killer. Uh, and this yeah. comes not too long after uh, the detective explains to everyone that the Gemini killer was caught and, and executed, that's true, but the MO of the killer was never revealed to the press. In fact, they intentionally released the wrong MO to to wean out people who claimed to be the killer, but they, they could figure out weren't based on the false information. But all of these new killings fit the MO, the, the exact same fingers cut off, the symbols put in the, the palm of the hand where it was in those old killings. So this is like bringing up these memories of this like deranged killer from 15 years ago. I'm explaining a lot here because it's all, all of this like <laughs> comes to together. <laughs> yeah, so it's a lot comes together. So you, you've got these killings which match this MO, but you've also got the idea that it's, the killer seems to be possessing uh, different people. At least two of the three were <laughs> old people from this ward in the hospital people who would never you'd be suspected of the killings because physically they just couldn't do them right they physically can't yeah. uh but as we see later when they're possessed they they've got super strength and shit so <laughs> no, no concerns there so that's where we're getting to the the big part of the movie which is mm-hmm. this patient x in this room <laughs> is father Karras, or at least looks like father Karras, <gasps> right it's the actor from the first Whoa. movie jason miller and the detective says this and then we have a big scene where he's just in there talking to him and then he switches the actor switches from uh, jason miller father Karras, to brad Dourif, who says he's the gemini killer and he talks about his old killings he talks about how he killed these new people <laughs> what's going on in the movie to make all this make some kind of sense <laughs> which is explained in the second time that the detective goes to talk to him because there's, there's two big scenes where he goes to talk to him in his cell and he's sitting there in the straight jacket and the detective talks to him and we get a lot of cryptic things from him but what's happened here what we what is discovered through all these conversations is that at the end of the first movie when father Karras got the the demon out of out of reagan and he went out the window to kill himself and he went down the stairs just as he was dying he was you know officially dead officially dead and brain dead this was right around the same time that this this killer was executed. The Gemini killer was executed for his crimes. Mm. Pazuzu, although they never say Pazuzu, and I'm just using that so because it's easy to yeah. have a name for it. But the demon, right? Pazuzu mm-hmm. was livid that he had been defeated. He was livid that he was tricked out of Reagan's body and that he was stopped. So he found the spirit of the Gemini killer in the void, as as the Gemini killer puts it, and he takes that spirit. And as a punishment to Father Karras, he put, puts the Gemini killer into Father Karras's body. And he's there for a long time and the body can't really do anything, but he eventually does get a little better, I guess. That, that, that part was a little bit vague. That he, he just got a supernatural spooky. He got better. Um, yeah. But he, you know, at least at the time he was able to get out of the coffin. He, he, he used to walk <laughs> around. This is when he was picked up, presumably as a patient and was comatose for a long mm-hmm. time because of how brain dead he was. Uh, but the idea is, is that whenever the Gemini killer, now that he's strong enough to actually reach out and possess other people to commit his murders, Father Karras, his punishment is that he is witnessing and he's aware that he's doing all this. He's actually there to to see all these crimes be committed. Mm-hmm. That's his punishment for stopping Pazuzu in the first movie. And that's the part of this that I really like for the record. Because when I'm describing a lot of this, it does kind of sound kind of crazy when you just say it all, all out loud. It is kind of this nuts premise it, to a sequel to The Exorcist. I, I do think it is nice, though, to hear it, like, all <laughs> laid out very, like, uh, you know, matter-of-factly. <laughs> because, like, <laughs> I, I don't think that the movie is hard to follow, but there is so much going on that, um, like... I, I think it, it is uh, a little easy to get lost at points in it. it. It definitely presents it in a way where it's giving you, it's strip feeding you little bits of it, and you're kind yeah. of like piecing parts of it together, and you're kind of realizing other parts. Um, you know, when you meet Father Karras in the cell, but he's talking mm. like he's evil. He's not talking like Father Karras, obviously. 
Um, yeah. He he then switches to Brad Dourif, and you're like, okay, what's going on here exactly? Mm-hmm. Brad Dourif's the killer, but Father Karras isn't. It's just Father... Like, because I'm thinking, <laughs> oh, it's like... You know, because I wasn't necessarily convinced it was like his actual body to begin with, but then obviously, but yeah. later on, he explains no, it is his body. Mm-hmm. This was his punishment, and he's still in there. Oh, oh it's a little get out almost. It's like Father Karras is in the sunken place. Oh yeah, and, he, and he's <laughs> witnessing point, yeah. these awful murders being committed, and they are awful. This the Gemini killer, you know, Brad Dourif, when he's talking about mm-hmm. killing people, he says, you know, one of the things he says is that uh, they say that when, if you're decapitated whilst alive that you can still see and experience things for about 20 seconds before you actually properly die. Uh, so he always, like, hold, whenever he decapitates someone, he always, like, holds up their head and points it at their body so they can see themselves, <laughs> just so that they're seeing their own dead body as they die, which is just, you know, sick and sadistic. It's not nice. <laughs> yeah, it's particularly cruel. Uh, they also point out that he uses this uh, chemical or whatever to paralyze the victims so that they are awake and aware as he's like cutting things off and they're, they're experiencing it um and it's a very specific amount because they say if it's too little it won't quite work and if it's too much they'll just instantly die so mm-hmm. it's this perfect amount of this this paralytic to to make them be awake whilst he's like just torturing them and mutilating <laughs> them and whatever else yeah so like so the, the but the part i like though the part i like that i think actually gives it a lot of weight is the idea mm-hmm. that this entity is is so pissed and he still mm-hmm. and this entity still has power just because it's out of reagan doesn't mean all of a sudden it's this weak thing that doesn't have any like demonic mm-hmm. pull or force so the idea that it, it it did something in the void you know it found this evil spirit this evil person and put it into Karis's body so that eventually when enough time had passed he would have to like be this passenger for all these horrific crimes I actually think is a really like evil thing to do and makes it feel Absolutely. I, I don't think this makes the demon from the exorcist feel silly this makes it feel like because unlike the second movie where the, the demon is still just kind of around in Reagan but as far as the movie's concerned it just oh so they didn't accomplish mm-hmm. anything at the end of the first movie this still feels like he accomplished something and not only did he accomplish what he was the, what we thought he did at the end of the first movie it's the motivation for the demon to like get revenge to be pissed it's like no you beat me so i'm going to like do something ungodly horrific to you you know yeah i, I like that part <laughs> no uh, absolutely like it's uh again it's it doesn't feel like you know what the you think the typical uh route you would go down for <laughs> a sequel to the exorcist but i i do think like when you kind of sit back and look at it it's actually like a really really cool like interesting idea um and it's not just the yeah, same thing again i think that's the other key thing is that it's exactly, very different yeah, yeah. from the first movie yeah yeah because i think like you know the and i'm guessing this is kind of what the studio wanted but like the, the easy thing to do would be like just all right uh another possession mm-hmm. <laughs> another priest that's kind of questioning their faith and blah 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 um and which and again <laughs> you know two really sucks but <laughs> to <laughs> give it a little bit of credit at least it did try to do oh, yeah. some different stuff it just doesn't work honestly that's the um, only positive point you can give to it, is that it didn't just try and do the same thing yeah. again right <laughs> like everything else is wrong but at least it didn't mm. just do the same plot again i mean that's fair yeah. that's a fair statement <laughs> uh but yeah i love that this is like you know it, it's bringing in all these like new ideas and it's like uh yeah it, it's you know it, it's uh like a procedural like you know it's uh bringing in like all this like serial killer stuff that is really interesting and uh and i'll give it props for this like i usually don't like horror movies that kind of like you know bring in the cops and make it like all about like you know trying to solve like a a case and stuff but uh you know like i i think you know we talk a lot about the <laughs> that being like an aspect of the saw movies that you know didn't really yeah. like is that they felt more like like kind of shitty <laughs> like um you know like cop dramas or, or whatever but uh but this it's done like really well like yeah i think uh you know george c scott's character is a really you know interesting like likable character and it's uh you know fun to solve them and it is such like kind of a uh wacky like case that you know it's interesting getting the bread com- breadcrumbs and like starting to figure stuff out and um you know you're talking about the the scenes where he's in the cell interviewing um you know Karis slash you know Gem- the Gemini killer Brad Dorf whatever uh, like those scenes are like are so well done like they're so creepy and then just the way you know he's just 
like so so like kind of slunk back into the shadows and then the it, you know the way it switches between like the bodies it's just really well done and like creepy like it's uh yeah like it, it's it's very captivating like watching those scenes yeah absolutely it, those are really entertaining and i think the reason why it works because you, you're talking about how like we don't typically mm-hmm. like when a horror movie focuses on a detective because it, that tends to put it into more thriller territory uh, even yeah. if it, you know because obviously there's great detective hunt and serial killer movies on silence of the lambs you know things like that but uh, i mean uh zodiac is like one of the best movies ever made in yeah. my opinion. but i actually wouldn't but i wouldn't call that a horror movie really there's a couple of good right, yeah. tense scenes in it and so, same with silence of the lambs mm-hmm. but i don't really consider them horror movies in the same way i think what yeah. makes this a horror movie is this like you know like what, what he's ultimately uncovering is this force of evil that's so horrific and powerful that you know he can't just like you know, you can't arrest it. You can't stop it. Yeah. It's, it's just a very different thing. There's only one way you can ultimately stop it, and it's a really tragic thing that he has to do to, to stop it. You know, and we'll get to that. But mm-hmm. uh, I think that's what makes it more of a horror movie. Is this like this sense of dread that kind of fills in? Is like this is not mm-hmm. like just a person that I'm hunting. There's something more to this. Uh, yeah. So, so that that and, works really well. Yeah. And and then obviously, like you know, it's someone that. Uh, you know, the detective has, like, a personal relationship with, like, it's a very good friend of his, so it's, like, you know, this added extra layer of, like, you know, the demon is now taunting the detective with, like, the face of, you know, this man that, you know, he was, like, really close to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I I, I really t- like the... Because, obviously, once we get to these scenes, um, after the first time he talks to... Uh, patient X, Karis slash Brad Dourif, slash the Gemini Killer. <laughs> we have to let's just call him Patient X, right? Just that's, that's the catch-all for him talking to the person in the in the room. I, li- I like it because it sounds like so comic booky. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's after the, so in the first scene he talks to I mean, he he does mention someone named Amy, you know, as if that's going to be the next victim, and that leads us to the scene with the nurse, uh, the the scene that most people remember this movie for is this long shot looking down the hallway and you can see sort of the receptionist desk where the nurse sort of works but she's like making you know she hears a noise or something and she comes up towards the camera which is up near the back of the hallway and she goes into a patient's room there's a slight noise and then there's a really good like fake out jump scare where it's just the patient sort of jumps up and starts complaining that she woke him up but it's like really like the, this you know it's a really there's no like sting that accompanies it it's just the sound of him sitting up and saying hey and it's like oh shit you know you get a little jump scare and then you think, oh, she's safe now because they're the security guard or whoever is like next to her and comes out and talks mm-hmm. to her when she goes back to her reception desk. But then he eventually leaves. And you know, <laughs> this goes on for quite a while. And the eventual payoff is she comes out of one of the rooms that's near the reception desk. And then just as she does that, like a figure dressed in white with these big surgical shears, like follows her out from behind. And the camera kind of like quickly just does a little zoom in. Mm-hmm. As as this happens, it's, so <laughs> it's it's a really great end to the scene. But it's it's you know it's a solid like. It's not. I mean, it's not all one shot. It does cut mm-hmm. to another shot when she goes into the first room. So there is like a break yeah. in the middle, uh, shot wise. But it's mostly this wide shot of the you know looking down the hall. Um, that I mean the like, scene which is mostly just those two shots lasts like probably like five minutes maybe. It it truly feels <laughs> like it goes on forever and. Which, you know, I, I'm not saying that in a bad way. Like, I mean, some people will probably complain about it if you, you know, if you don't have any taste or something like, you know, but like, oh, it's <laughs> so slow and boring. Uh, but I mean, I, I think if you're people like us that do kind of crave, like, you know, uh, you know, something like this that can just show uh, someone really having patience to build a scene and to, you know, put you in the, into like, um, like, it, like it, it affects you, like, you know, uh, because, yeah, at, at first you're feeling nervous. You feel like something's going to happen. Then, like, you kind of feel safe. And then, like you're saying, like, yeah, like, security card comes. And then security guard leaves. And, like, you you know, you're going through these emotions of, like, oh, man, like, I know something's going to happen. And, like, I'm feeling tense and scared. And, like, okay, now I feel like things might be a little better. And then, uh, yeah, and then, it, you know, it cuts to, yeah, this is a great jump scare, which... Uh, it feels so well earned though. Like it's you know like a lot. We complain about jump scares a lot, but often it's because they're, they're very cheap and gimmicky and just come out of nowhere just to give you a shock. Like you know, this is such a great example of something that uh, you know it is taking the time to build up to it, and it's not like you know just trying to like 
scare you out, out of nowhere it's you know uh i don't know it's well earned and well deserved <laughs> well there's a few i think there's a few things that go into that one there's mm-hmm. like no jump scares the entire movie up until that point that's true yeah so there's that i think two the scene goes on for a long time with a static shot so just the mm-hmm. filmmaking fills you with a sense that we're building to something like the re- we're still sitting with mm-hmm. it the fact that we stick with the scene after that first sort of fake out jump stare means that eventually the real thing is going to happen and then the third thing which is you know quite simple to see is that when she goes into this guy's room and we get the fake jump scare he's mad that she woke him up and she says you know you've done this on purpose i'm going to report you what's your name and she shows shows her name tag and it says amy something and that's Mm. the point where the audience goes oh shit that's what (laughs) you know patient x just said you know implied the Mm. next victim would be so that puts us on like so even though we've had the fake out jump scare the fake out jump scare has been used to confirm that this person is the one who's in danger. So then the rest of the scene, you're watching it play out and you're still waiting for it. Um, and the visual of the person with the, the big ridiculous shears. Like, I almost... these big This big weapon made me want just a slasher movie with a killer running around <laughs> with this thing. Because it, it was yeah. such a, a fun weapon. And there's a great moment later with them. Uh, that <laughs> it's, a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a just miss moment. But I kind of like, I want a movie <laughs> where... I want to see people get their heads chopped off with this thing. This looks great. Yeah, I, actually, that that's a very good point. Like, you know, I feel like so caught up in the scene that, yeah, I actually, like, forget to mention that the ending of it, like, is just such a great visual, too. Like, you know, the big giant weapon and this, like, the long, flowy, like, you know, hospital gown or shield yeah, or whatever so like gown, that yeah. they're wearing. It, it just, it looks great. Like, you know, it just, it's just has this great, creepy, tense uh, look to it. And, um, and again, it, it's just very interesting to be, like, Oh, uh, you know, I, I'm assuming, again, that he's not necessarily, you know, he had the one other movie, but, you know, Blatty uh, doesn't really seem like, you know, that the movie making is necessarily like, you know, his world. But uh, he shows off so many great instincts uh, in this, you know, it's like, oh, I mean, maybe he's kind of a natural. I don't know. Um, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Quentin Tarantino, after all, didn't go to film school. He just worked in a video store for X number of years. So what's That's true? I think fills a lot of people with this false hope that they can just make movies because it's actually very hard, and then most people do oh, have, to, have to like learn a lot to be able to do it. But there are some people who just naturally I mean, take to it somehow. <laughs> yeah, and, and especially like with the Quentin Tarantino thing, I feel like every video store had at least one employee that thought they were going to be the next, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. Tarantino. I'm like, oh, I also watch a bunch of movies. <laughs> I'd probably be good at this. And then the universe like got the last laugh by making video stores themselves extinct. So no yes. one else can ever think that ever again. <laughs> uh, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, no, like, so this is a great scene, obviously, and they find the body the next day, and it's it's all very morose. And in fact, the, mm. the doctor who showed Detective Kinderman this patient, you know, patient X, uh, mm. commits suicide as well uh, <coughs> the same night. They find his body at the same time, pretty much, as they're at the crime scene with her. And... Mm. You know, it's just this idea that we, we find the second time he goes to talk to, to patient X, patient X explains that, oh, can, uh, the, the, the doctor was helping me. He was scared of me. You know, I, I made him, mm-hmm. you know, uh, get me certain things. And obviously, Kinderman's like, well, does he, did he let you out? And obviously, he's not caught into the fact that he's just possessing people. He's just traveling into other people to commit the murders. But he's mm-hmm. like, so who's letting you out of the room to go and commit the murders? And obviously, I think the audience by this point knows, like, he's not getting out of the cell. He's just, mm-hmm. you know, he's doing it from his cell. He's he's just taking control of others. But um, this is and where... It kinda makes, uh, and it kind of makes sense, too. Like, if you have, like, a hospital with, like, you know, people that are, like, comatose or whatever, like, you know, like, he mentioned something about, like, oh, it's so much easier when they're yeah, comatose, yeah. which is, like, an interesting idea being, like, oh, yeah, like, you know, if you can possess, like... um you know, a body that's basically, like, well, not you even, know, brain dead or... <laughs> yeah, not even just comatose. I think it's just, ge- in general, patients who are, you know, their brains are kind of gone. You know, like, those yeah. types of patients, like, for whatever reason, they're easier to possess. They can't fight back. So, that, like, he just... He, he uses them as his toys, basically, as murder weapons. Which, again, like, is another interesting idea, like, you know, instead of... Yeah, it's like, what's the opposite of the first movie where one young girl is possessed? Uh, how about, like, a whole hospital full of, like, old <laughs> people that you, like, can't fight back? After all, we are Legion. Mm. We are many. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, like, I, I like that. So, during this conversation as well, the second time he speaks to Patient X, 
Kinderman, of course, like gets more provoking with him, and that prompts Patient X to say, "Oh, you've entered. You know, you've ju- you've just invited yourself into the dance." Or so it was, it's a line like that <laughs> that implies that now they might go after him because that's the thing. What we probably didn't mention is that the first three victims um, were all connected to the original exorcism. It was you know the priest who was was friends with Mary, and it was the priest who approved the exorcism that worked at the church. And uh, I think they said the, the young boy was the son of the, the person who like translated or figured out the tape of Reagan speaking backwards. Mm. So it was all people connected to the original exorcism. And that was like, the, like Patient X was doing that. That, like, that was the price for getting this body to like do more crimes and murders with was mm. uh, like, you have to go after the people that you've pissed off. I think he kept saying his master, like, you know, like my master yeah. mm-hmm. was livid. I had to like do this for him. So... Mm-hmm. Um, but because he provokes him, because Kinderman provokes him in this scene, it's like, okay, um, now someone close to you. And, you know, it was established earlier in the movie that we, you know, we meet Kinderman's wife, his mother-in-law, and most importantly, his daughter, uh, Julie, mm-hmm. who, you know, he realizes uh, over the next couple of scenes, because he also threatens a young boy. He also gives this young boy's name. So they kind of start to, like, protect <laughs> this young kid, this young ginger kid who's in the hospital. It's okay, let's, <laughs> let's put security on him. Let's make sure he's safe. Mm-hmm. And then he looks at the name tag on the nurse that's been in the movie a lot, and he's like, oh, wait a minute. Julie, that's my daughter's name. And he realizes that he's going to go after his daughter. So we get this scene towards the end of the movie where Kinderman's racing home to try and like save his daughter. And we've seen, as this is playing out, that another old woman in the hospital has become possessed. Uh, there's like a, One of the, the regular nurses has turned up dead and her outfit's been stolen. So one of the old people have walked out of the hospital dressed as a nurse and are making mm-hmm. her way to his house to kill his daughter mm-hmm. and Ki- you know kinderman gets home he comes in and everyone seems fine but then he goes into the kitchen and this old woman is sitting there and it's like she's just talking like she's one of the patients she's like confused she doesn't know where she is she's asking mm-hmm. for help but then her voice changes to brad durf and he says <laughs> i just wanted you to see this and the old woman pulls out the giant shears from a bag <laughs> next to her chair. And we get this like slow motion moment where she's going to like, because this is the daughter sitting at the table next to her and she, she like goes and like the blades are actually around the daughter's neck. And it's actually the mother-in-law, the one with the fish <laughs> who just grabs her daughter's head and pulls her back to save her. Um, Great th- timing and good thinking. <laughs> yeah. It looks a little bit weird as a shot. There's something about the motion it's... of it that looks a bit weird to me. I like the moment. Yeah. Like, I think the actual like the the, the 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 near miss with the blades is a really fun, like tense moment. But the actual mm-hmm. visual of the head being pulled away it does look a bit weird. Yeah, the, I actually I didn't really have time, but I did want to go back and rewatch it because, yeah, there was like some, I don't know, like uncanny valley or, or something this uh, to it that just didn't really like seem quite right. Um, I, I don't know if it was a shutter speed thing or or maybe it was um maybe for safety's sake they sort of did it twice and like put them together so that there was no mm-hmm. danger of i don't know like uh if anything though i would su- suggest it's maybe something to do with like uh like because they've slowed it down maybe they shot it at a frame rate that makes yeah. it look weird when they slowed mm-hmm. i don't know like if there was something just a little off about it yeah but um still like it's uh you know doesn't really ruin the scene or anything though it is just like a little <laughs> weird yeah no no the scene's really good um so he- here's the interesting thing is that the basically the, the the old woman has got super strength here and she, she she throws kinderman up against the wall and she's really strong but then she's kind of like reacts like something's bad's happened to her right or or you know uh, the gemini killer reacts in her body as if something bad's happened and she kind of just kind of collapses in the scene and the implication in the theatrical cut of the movie is that what's interrupted like his possession is that this other priest uh, is coming to his cell and that's kind of like the interruption he, he has to like come back to his body to mm-hmm. deal with this priest who's coming to try and exercise him which mm-hmm. is it, it works well enough in the movie you can kind of tell that this priest because mm-hmm. it's, it's the priest who works in the chapel and the the hospital right that they that he's mentioned in one scene earlier on and then we see him a couple of times on his own just like reading up on exorcisms and stuff but he mm-hmm. never interacts with any of the other characters in the movie He's just kind of on his own separate scenes. So you can kind of tell that he was maybe added after the fact. Like they, they, they sort of wrote these extra scenes, <clears throat> but he never interacts with anyone else. 
outside of the, the actual exorcism scene at the end, which they obviously reshot to include him and all mm-hmm. that stuff. But he actually tries to come into the room and exorcise him. And uh, yeah, I, I don't necessarily hate this idea. Like, yeah, yeah not, it, not, not do I. I, I. I honestly, like, it made sense to me in the moment that the reason why, yeah. he, the, you know, the killer's interrupted when he's, like, attacking the family is because mm-hmm. there's, like, a, another threat, like, local to him. Yeah. That, that made sense in the moment to me. I, I don't know how it plays mm-hmm. out in the director's cut without that interruption mm-hmm. and why it doesn't, why, why she doesn't just kill everyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, so... Um, I mean, the exorcism seems fun enough, you know. Like, there's a uh, the book explodes. Uh, he get uh, you know, he is put on the ceiling, and he sort of tries to <laughs> like the, the priest tries to peel off the ceiling, so you see some of his He's skin like ripping stuck. off. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's actually the most gory part of the whole movie. Is this uh, yeah. like, and maybe that's like part of the okay. This is maybe losing the nuance a little bit, and it's a little mm. overly like you know grotesque and cinematic for the sake of spectacle, but. I mean, as a horror movie fan, I, d- I did enjoy it <laughs> for what it yeah, was. Yeah, it looked cool. <laughs> you know, so that's what it is. Uh, the priest seems to die here and fails the exorcism. And then mm-hmm. that's when George C. Scott, uh, doc- uh, doctor, Detective Kinderman <laughs> comes in with his gun and his plan is just to shoot, shoot Patient X in the head. He's like, okay, mm-hmm. if, the, if the only way to deal with this, like, I'm never going to be able to arrest you for this. I'm never going to be able to prove that you're doing this or feel safe if you're coming after my family members. I'm just going to shoot yeah. you in the head. Uh, but sure enough, like, he's able to just, like, put up Kinderman against the wall with his, you know, his powers, right? So Kinderman's, mm-hmm. like, sort of in a crucifixion pose up against the wall, and he feel you, know, you get this sort of wave effect going over him, and Patient X is, like, mm-hmm. monologuing, of course, uh, as you will. And there's a whole, like, horrific thing here where Father Carras is on a cross, and, like, uh, lightning starts striking inside the room and eventually makes a big hole in the floor, where Father Carras is on a cross and it comes up through the ground with all these hands around him. And it's, I think it's some of the victims mm-hmm. that are around him, like some of the faces. But mm-hmm. uh, it's this like big moment, but it's not really there. It cuts back to just like they're in the room and it's just Kinderman's up against it's the cool wall. It's visual. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's very, honestly, the lightning in the room did feel quite unique. It felt like they put a lot of effort into that effect. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so given that that was entirely seemingly a reshoot that wasn't in the original version of the movie, like they put a lot of effort into it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'll, give it, I'll give it that. It had some pizzazz. Like, I liked it way more than the house like, falling apart at the end of Exorcist 2. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it felt more unique and more interesting to me. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Um, but, uh, just as he's about to kill Kinderman, though, um, the priest who was trying to exorcise him before is still alive, and he grabs his his cross that's on the floor and starts, you know, saying more stuff. Like, I command you, I command you. He's like, you know, Father Karras, fight him, fight him, Karras. You're in there. You can fight him. And sure enough, uh, Karas sort of, like, fights him and gains control for a second and immediately just says to Kinderman, shoot me now, do it now. And he shoots him. He dies. <laughs> you know? Um, he sort of still mutters something and then he sh- the final shot's in the head. Uh, and in the end of the movie, at least in the theatrical cut, is just, uh, like, you know, Kinderman uh, and he's like sort of not his partner, but like there's another cop that's kind of with him occasionally in the movie, or at Kar- Karasi's grave. Uh, but he's finally freed him. Now he's no longer trapped. So it's kind of sad because he has to kill this guy who was his friend all these years ago. Yeah. But it's also he's freeing him from this torment of like having to like witness all these brutal murders. So he he set him free effectively at, at the <laughs> end of the movie. Uh, so. It's a big bombastic ending, yeah. you know. Yeah, but um, yeah, I mean, I I think it works. Like, it's very, very easy to get caught up in. It. It's all very, you know, striking visually, and um, yeah, it you know it works as a, you know, resolution to like all the stuff that we had, you know, going throughout the movie. <laughs> like, you know, not really many many other places to go. <laughs> Yeah, I really... So one of the things that we've not really mentioned yet is at the start of the movie, Kinderman... Uh, is not, he's, he's not a man of faith. You know, he, he meets up with, mm. you know, uh, Father Dyer to go to the movies, right? And we, we, <laughs> he kind of has this conversation with him where he's talking about uh, how like some of the bad things that are happening, like this murder that he's just like been put on, like, the God's kind of a shithead if he does this sort of thing, right? That's not his, his exact wording, but that's how I'm <laughs> paraphrasing. And at the end of the movie, when he's up against the wall in the crucifix pose, and, uh, you know, 
the Gemini killer's like, hey, have I, have I like, helped your belief? Have I, like, made you believe? And he has this monologue, Kinderman, where he says, yeah, you have made me believe. I believe in murder. I believe in death. I believe in infidelity. <laughs> he basically lists all these things that go on in the world. And he never quite, mm. like, becomes this, like, man of God. You know, he never does mm. that. He, he is kind of true to who he was in the first place. Um, and he's just here to stop bad things. Um, I, mm. I thought that was an interesting take, because I think... Especially given the first movie's all, you know, largely about Karas well, re- regaining his faith, right? I mean, that's what I was going to ask because, like, yeah, the one of the big sticking points in the, in the first movie review is, you know, to to kind of put it bluntly, like, you, you know, you, you weren't crazy about how churchy <laughs> it kind of <laughs> ends up getting. So I'm curious <laughs> that if this worked a little better for you. It's, it's a very broad way of putting that, yes, but it was a bit too churchy <laughs> for me. No, I, I, I kind of did appreciate that. I appreciate it. Mm-hmm. It, it wasn't like him saying that no, none of this stuff. It's, it's not that like none of this doesn't exist, or I don't, or I, I, I'm saying it definitely doesn't exist. He's just kind of like, I believe in all these bad things, and I've, I've, mm-hmm. I've been continuing to try to stop them, and I'm always going to keep fighting to stop them. It's like, you know, it's that kind of. It's because the idea here at the at the end of the movie, he he shoots Karis in the face to stop this killer and to stop the the spread of this evil the demons kind of unleashed upon the world. Um, because that's that's the interesting thing here is that the demon from the first movie, Pazuzu, if you you know to give him the name, he's never actually in this movie. Like this no. is you know he he's he's put put it into motion. He gave the Gemini killer this body. He gave him this power to do what he's doing, but he's not actually around in the movie. Um, mm-hmm. I think that's quite interesting. But the and that's a kind of a, a you know an annoying thing we were talking about in the second movie where it makes him feel like this Saturday morning cartoon yeah, villain if yeah. he's always getting beaten and but being like oh I'll be back next week Absol- or whatever. Absolutely. But you know he, he so he kills Father Caris to like set him free, which is obviously kind of nice in its own right. But this isn't him. <laughs> you know, it, it, you know, it, it's, it, he's freeing him. He's taking him away from his torment, all that stuff. Mm. But what what I think is quite kind of interesting about it from the perspective of like like, who he is as a character, Kinderman, is that he, he's doing this for that reason. He's, he's doing it to stop him from hurting anyone else, and he's doing it to sort of mm-hmm. set his friend free. He's doing what he thinks he can do to accomplish good, to fight back evil. But he mm-hmm. never, like, you know, turns to the church. He never, like, starts to really believe in all this stuff. And even if this stuff kind of proves mm-hmm. to an extent that it is real, he never, like, becomes someone else as a result of that. He's very kind of... uh determined and he he sticks to his guns if you will um i thought it was interesting it's actually yeah and it's actually kind of refreshing because i feel like we've seen the story a million times where uh you know usually it's a person of faith but you know it's like someone who yeah doesn't believe in god anymore or you know has had some type of tragedy so they you know they lost their faith and then you know the end of the movie is regaining that and then you know essentially using the power of faith to kind of overcome whatever evil entity it is and uh it's actually kind of nice to have a movie where it's like no like i don't need to do that like you know i can uh i can still defeat you like on my own you know and it's not just like a big uh you know it end up being like you know a big advertisement you know for how great god is or whatever (laughs) it's just like uh no uh, yeah i'm just doing it I mean, myself baby yeah because it's father Karas who's able to fight and regain control for a minute it's, it's his own personal will of fighting back for a second mm-hmm. that opens up the opportunity to just kill him mm-hmm. and then it's you know kinderman killing him out of the the kindness if, if you want to call it that or uh, <laughs> you know whatever but like mm-hmm. you, you can kind of attribute the victory if you, you know, and again it's a very bittersweet victory obviously there's nothing really happy about yeah. it but it's kind of this bittersweet victory that comes out of many things and not all of it can be attributed to just the power of, of church or God. Um, mm. And it's very, it's very interesting counterpoint to the first exorcist. And I'm, um, yeah. you know, it, again, it's not like the main character rescinds it at the end or, or says it had nothing to do with it, but the movie very much says this character is in the world and he doesn't have to become mm. someone who like, talks the word of god and believes in god mm-hmm. and talks about the church and becomes like this very very catholic person to to mm-hmm. fight this evil he's he's a soldier for good in the world and that's all that matters it doesn't matter that he's not uh going to church every week and uh yeah. devoutly believing in things he's still just a soldier for good in the world for whatever reason mm-hmm. so i don't know i thought it was kind of interesting uh yeah uh so yeah he's kind of a fascinating character honestly uh 
Again, again much like the Changeling, uh, George C. Scott is a very <laughs> unconventional protagonist for, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a horror movie. But that, that's twice he's he's done a pretty good job of it, and it works. The, the movie's arguably more interesting because that he's this older man going through the story yeah. as opposed to someone else. And I think it helps a lot that you know, Blatty like clearly has you know some type of a, a, like a affinity or affection for this character because uh, yeah, like you know, I I remember um, I I never read Legion, which actually maybe I should at some point that kind of sounds interesting, mm-hmm. but I did read the original Exorcist and. Um, yeah, like the detective did feel like a you know bigger part in it, and you could kind of tell it was like seemed like one of those characters that the author just really liked, so he's just kind of thrown in there, like oh yeah, I like this cop that loves movies, <laughs> and um, so yeah, I mean I feel like yeah, part of that is he must have just really liked this character, so you know he it was able to kind of come up with this like you know pretty good story for him. Yeah, and you know, obviously, I had so much like plot stuff to explain. We kind of glossed over some of the quieter moments that came along with these moments, like. When he discovers a dream sequence, <laughs> well, yeah, oh yeah, that's a good point. I was, well, what I was going to say before we get to that <laughs> is he's got like a when he first finds out that his friend Father uh, Dyer has died in the hospital. You know, mm-hmm. the, there's actual there's genuine emotion like him seeing the body and like lifting up sure. the sheet and looking at him. Like there's a lot of weight yeah. to that scene. It it feels like it's mm-hmm. hitting them and this evil of the world's really starting to get to him. Um, you know, and I, I, I guess that's the other thing that works with the Gemini Killer for me is that. The evil in the movie is actually just a human being. Yeah, it's a human being mm-hmm. that's been given more power, but the idea that the evil in the world is, exists anyway, and you can read that, you know, that's in a, a sort point, of biblical yeah. sense of like, mm-hmm. uh, all the evil people in the world come from a place of evil anyway, which comes from the mm-hmm. demons and Satan and whatever else. Uh, or you can read it as, no, it's all these people that become evil in the world that create the, the idea of evil and then that manifests and so on and so on. But mm-hmm. regardless, look, that's also a very interesting idea. But yes, the weird dream sequence you want to talk about, which is the train station for, like, the afterlife, where it's, like, angels behind the counter, and George C. Scott's, like, wandering around, and it's mostly people in hospital beds who are clearly dying, mm-hmm. who are, like, basically, like, being checked in on before it's time for them to, to move on. Yeah, it's just super bizarre in a movie that's, like, I don't know, like, I guess feels, like, somewhat grounded uh, for all, like, the crazy stuff that's going on. To all of a sudden just have this like one scene where he's essentially like in heaven and just walking around and like you know these big white like cloudy kind of i don't know if there are any actual clouds but you know it's like big and white like mm. you know when you know they, they depict heaven <laughs> it's like people with angel wings and stuff it's just uh yeah i mean i, I don't have much to say it but it was just kind of very striking to it's a well scene. Like, I, weird little part <laughs> i wonder if that was in the uh director's cut like if that was in the original if this was or if this was more jazzing up to try and make it a bit more spectacle because the other thing that stuck out to me which uh i i did like this scene but again it's like an an otherwise very grounded movie for most of it um Mm -hmm. when he's in like the old folks part of the hospital and it's just before he finds the nurse's dead body uh the first old woman who seemingly was used to commit the murder in the hospital earlier on uh Mm -hmm. is like crawling around the ceiling Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, and he never sees her. He he he's he's unaware, but she's like crawling around the ceiling, and looking down, like 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 she's all evil. Um, <laughs> this was the old woman that uh, you know seemingly was used to kill Father Dyer earlier in the film, mm-hmm. uh, but it's a different old woman who's killed the nurse and is left wearing her outfit to go and kill uh, <laughs> Kinderman's family or at least his daughter mm-hmm. anyway. So yeah, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of memorable mm-hmm. little scenes. Um, but it's also very like there's also a lot of quiet moments with him like researching and going and reading some of the because like at one point uh, patient X quotes something and he kind of recognizes it and it turns out to be from the Exorcist like part of the Bible <laughs> or <laughs> or that was the Bible but the, uh, something to do with exorcisms like so, something you right, say right. in the exorcisms mm-hmm. uh, so yeah yeah it's an interesting movie yeah with some really well directed moments uh, some even even the stuff that feels added on for the theatrical cut or we know is added on for the theatrical cut. I don't necess- necessarily think I dislike it. I think it works well enough in the moment. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, maybe, maybe if I could see like, the 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 original vision in a you know a decent f- format I would be I maybe I'd like it more. I don't know. But it yeah, it, it's hard to say cuz I'm sure you know I'd, I'd want to side with like you know the director usually but like um yeah, w- without being able to see it and 
just the fact that like well <laughs> the version we got is pretty damn good it's kind of hard to yeah i really like be like well I, yeah i'm already very satisfied i, I don't really need a, a bunch of other stuff and uh i don't know i i just feel very burnt out because there's like you know a time when uh you know like when dvds were really popular so they like were putting out so many like director's cuts or then mm. you know then it just got to the point where it's just like the unrated cut or whatever and it's it's very seldom like better <laughs> like you know uh a lot of times it's basically just like oh yeah it's the same movie but we just threw in a bunch of extra scenes <laughs> and they're usually like oh, okay there's a reason why you know these were cut or whatever yeah, there's some um, notable examples where the director's cut is the better version, but mm -hmm. it's yeah, there's you know there's a lot of just like we wanted to release a second version of the movie, so here's yeah a longer cut. However, interestingly, in this case, the director's cut is shorter than the theatrical cut. Oh, interesting. It's about yeah. six minutes shorter. Yeah, because hmm. uh, well, the entire exorcism at the end is gone. So oh, that's fair. That's that's, that's, that's for a start. <laughs> that's gone, and then there's some other things that are switched around. Mm -hmm. uh maybe one day i'll watch the director's cut with the, the crappy reinserted footage <laughs> to see to see if it's uh see what it's like but i'm intrigued at the very least so yeah but hey uh very interesting film well directed yeah. really memorable sequences in there uh good cast and a very unconventional mm -hmm. cast because it is you know an older man and it's uh mm -hmm. you know it's not young people <laughs> for a change yeah. so no <laughs> interesting so but there you go I, I guess we'll uh we'll rate the movie tim what are you given exorcist 3 um yeah so this is one that i feel like i want to uh i want to watch more because i feel like 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 i said like i've only seen it a, a few other times and it's one of those ones where i do feel like maybe i, I get a little more appreciative like each time i watch it especially like talking about it for about you know a little over an hour uh that yeah, you know, there's a lot of you know reminding of like you know even though I just watched it, but just being reminded of like oh yeah that scene was really cool and they're like oh yeah it is cool how they tie it all together, um, yeah I mean I, I'm really uh, impressed with this movie I think um, I don't know, for, for me it's really hard to to say if it's better than the first one, um, but. I, cause you know, the freaking is a, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, bloody kills it uh, on this movie, but you know, freaking is a really damn good director. Uh, and uh, that first one is damn good. But you know, if someone says that they prefer this to the original, I'd like, I don't know. It's not shocking to me. Like there's a lot of really good stuff in this. It's not like a, a crazy uh, opinion to have. Like if someone said they liked, the second one better than the first one like it <laughs> should probably be locked up <laughs> somewhere um but yeah i think i'm i was kind of debating between like an 8.5 or a 9 uh and i don't know I, I i maybe i'm just feeling a little generous but i think i'll give it the nine it's uh whoa yeah it's a really like you know and especially considering like the fact that it's about like an hour and 50 minutes or so it, it feels like kind of a, a brisk movie like i know it's just very easy to get caught up in it the there's a lot of like just really good well done scenes and very memorable uh scares and there's just like a lot of creepy atmosphere and, and again it's just I, I don't know i'm impressed with a lot of it like the story uh you know I, I think is cool like the you know actors and performances are all well done and the directing is surprisingly well done like yeah it's not really like a lot of like super big like obvious flaws or anything uh in the movie so yeah i'm always happy <laughs> and get the, get the chance to watch this well uh i'm gonna sound not as positive now because i'm not gonna be about nine i'm not that daft mm -hmm. <laughs> um <laughs> no i, I think i think i'm happy to give it an eight which is mm. close to what i gave the original I, either the same or maybe I give the original an 8.5 i can't i can't remember off the top of my head but mm -hmm. I think it's a really solid movie with some really a really interesting premise and the mythology that it kind of adds to the Exorcist, uh, while it does take away a little bit of mystique, is it it's all very in exciting to me because it 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 becomes more like a mythology and the the sense of like a movie mythology and. It, but it's still kind of like off and otherworldly and the idea of the presence in the first movie being pissed that it got defeated 
and <laughs> being petty and giving like a, a an evil person from earth this like chance to continue to be awful uh <laughs> through like the character from the first movie i actually think that's a fascinating idea uh mm-hmm. that's the part that makes it like if you just told me oh this is a movie where so like a killer's possessing old people to commit murders i'm like okay that could be entertaining but i don't know if it necessarily be <laughs> that good from like a like a, a drama point of view but i think okay. the motivations behind it in this and ultimately like the main character struggling to deal with it and having to kill him by the end to put him down uh that does add a bit of weight to it so hmm. eight out of ten now give me a slasher movie with that <laughs> weapon please oh yeah <laughs> please and thank you uh mm-hmm. i mean there we got the burning which has got some great uh the burning was my first thought, yeah, yeah that, that's got that's, that's got shears but they're not these big weird mm-hmm. like surgical looking shears would you settle for maybe playing a little bit of clock tower would that <laughs> satisfy the itch <laughs> i don't know i don't know if i enjoy playing clock tower it's all running away from things but <laughs> but who knows maybe, maybe i'll give clock tower a try at some point uh, but that's been Exorcist 3. Uh, definitely a major uplift from Exorcist 2. And, well, I don't expect either of the prequels to be as bad as Exorcist 2. I've got a feeling I'm not <laughs> going to be super hot on them. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> so, uh, that won't be obviously next episode, but that'll be soon. So, come back for Exorcist the Beginning and Exorcist Dominion. Or, or mm-hmm. no, it's, it's Dominion prequel to The Exorcist. I don't know. It's something like that. That's, yeah, that's not about right. Whatever. The titles will be correct when we start the review. Don't worry, because we'll have watched it by then. But we're going to watch both versions and talk about them in the same episode. So uh, look forward mm-hmm. to that. Uh, but yeah, this has been Screams After Midnight. This has been our talking about Exorcist 3. Thank you very much for watching and listening. We always appreciate it. You can support all the content uh, and the show by going over to patreon.com slash TV and supporting us for as little as $3 per month and getting access to the back catalogue of bonus episodes and even more streams which is a monthly show. Uh, they're on pause right now, but there's a back catalogue and they'll be back uh, when Tim's back from paternity leave uh, mm-hmm. later in the year. So go and have a look and see if you're interested. And you can also get bonus content, of course, for other shows from Elfuzz Movies. Uh, so please do check it out. Of course, you can like, subscribe, ding the bell for notifications and leave some comments and all that good stuff. All of it does help as well. And of course, uh, rate the podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast from. Uh, give us five mm-hmm. stars and a nice review because uh, it does help. Uh, so all that's left I will thank our Patreon producers for the month thank you very much to Tyler Hess and DePelicius David Sharp Board now Christopher Moy David Brown and Al Tribesman thank you very much to you all so yeah there you go that's Exorcist 3 yeah <laughs> sometimes I leave it open for 10 minutes just sort of stares at me blankly like I'm <laughs> being unreasonable Mm. I'm very tired. <laughs> well, let's wrap it up then. This is Bid's Reads After Midnight. <laughs> Thank you once again for watching or listening. We always appreciate it. Keep watching scary movies, and we will see you next time.